on a Monday here on House Divided on Orange Bloods Live. I'm Jeff Ketchum. That is Chad Hastings. I finally feel like I've got my voice back. I've got my mojo back. Chad will tell you on Friday, I just wanted to go take a nap. So uh, it's good to be, I think, over the flow. We'll see how it goes. But on a Monday, I'm feeling good. Uh, do us a solid. Smash that thumbs up button. Just do it right now. As a matter of fact, uh, ants. Hey there, Ant. I'm 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 hitting the thumbs up button myself. I'm cheating. That gives us ten so far. Do that thing where you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, get notifications. We can't get to forty billion subscribers until we get to like twenty thousand. You can help us get there. Uh, welcome to everybody hopping into the specs chat. Ant from. Palm Bay, Florida. Doesn't sound like that would be a horrible place to be today. What's up, Mark Ruiz? Uh, a lot of UT football discussion today. Let's let's lay out our topics um, in this next hour-ish. Big time scrimmage discussion. I mean, we're probably going to hop into that. And I don't know how much more there will be early in the show. Uh, in fact, Chad, I've been... I wrote a column last night on Orange Bloods, but... I really have been thinking about the discussion of the Texas running back battle at the top. Cause last week we actually did a show where we kind of pointed out that not a whole lot of talk about the starters. Everybody just kind of assumes the top two guys are the top two guys, but there'd been so much discussion about Christian Clark and Trey Wisner and what's the pecking order through through three through six. And on Saturday, this interesting thing happens. Jason Sukumel goes to New York. It's his 51st birthday. Uh, Aaron Judge hits a home run for him. But he was kind of out of pocket on Saturday and Sunday. He's flying back to Austin today. So I was kind of in charge of all of the recruiting coverage. And we had some freelance guys. Thanks, Cole Patterson, for helping us out. We had the UTSA publisher for Rivals come down and help us out. I ended up listening to audio of about 20 different recruits. And I talked to my own sources and Anwar talked to his sources, but a really kind of interesting organic thing happens in that I don't know if Jason told these guys to all ask this question or if they all just felt like, given that they just watched a scrimmage, that it would be a part of every question they asked. So every single interview that Orange Bloods did with one of the prospects that were on hand on Saturday was, hey, man, you just saw the scrimmage. What stood out to you? And 20 different people had 20 different answers. And it was fascinating. To, this time, a lot of times that question's a dud. Guys will come back and they'll say, oh, you know, I didn't really watch a lot. I was doing other things. I don't know names. I only know numbers. Sometimes you just don't get anything. On this particular day, there were some actual answers. And some of them were really interesting. Um, DeCorey and more, and we'll talk more about this on the recruiting hour later today. We'll get into some heavy DeCorey and more discussion. But DeCorey and more made a point to stress like, damn, practice was super competitive super physical. I've never seen anything quite like it in practice. And it was like, huh, okay. You know, it's, well, if the coaches say that, it just sounds like talk. Football players, oh, this is, we're practicing harder than we've, you hear these things and you're like, okay, you say this every year, you know, X on the bingo card. But when prospects are saying it, it does hit a little bit different. At least a half dozen guys mentioned Jaden Blue on Saturday. Offensive guys, defensive guys, all very organically. Nobody set it up so that Jaden Blue would be the obvious answer. It's very much a generic, hey man, what stood out today at the scrimmage? And at least like one out of every three guys made a point to say, Jaden Blue is something else. He's good. And then I just started thinking, you know what? I haven't had anybody 
tell me through the first few weeks of camp that C.J. Baxter has stood out at all. Blue is constantly mentioned, not so much Baxter. In fact, the only time Baxter was mentioned on Saturday was when Racing Gilry uh, mentioned that Baxter had fumbled and that going into the meeting or for the before the scrimmage, Tashard Choice told all the guys in the room, I don't want to see any of you guys putting the ball on the turf. Mm-hmm. Baxter did. And he had to do bear crawls after practice. That's the only, I feel bad for putting CJ Baxter on blast. Yeah. The only comment that anybody made about CJ Baxter, it might be the only comment I've heard from anybody about CJ Baxter all camp long, but we know that CJ Baxter probably going to be the starter. He started over Jonathan Brooks last year. Steve Sarkeesian loves CJ Baxter. He recruited him. There's a lot of sweat equity there. And yet, Jaden Blue had better numbers last year, and I'll be damned if Jaden Blue is the name that gets mentioned all the time. And it was kind of the thing that was standing out to me about Saturday was, man, Jaden Blue is the best running back at Texas. And a number of people who have no skin in the game will make that note. The data is the data, and yet there's not a lot of real conversation about it. It's not the talking point of camp is like, who's going to start at running back. So yeah, my head's with the running backs today. Yeah. And it it is going to be something we watch as we are here. What's today's the eighth. So we're 12 days away from the spring game catch. We all would assume that the very first offensive setup is one back. We would, I'd be shocked if it was a two back set to start the game. So you know, it, let's assume they go ones versus twos. Let's assume it's one offense, two defense. When Quinn Ewers and his offense walk out there, who's that guy? I think that's now one of those things we will watch very closely. And we've talked about it. This These recruits getting a little extra, you know, getting to get into a meeting. The idea that what you just said about a coach saying they didn't want to see the ball on the ground and all that type of stuff, that that came from a recruit, that that didn't come from like inside sourcing. That came from a recruit who gets to watch meetings and who gets to watch practice. And for them to organically, different guys, you would, and I'm assuming you're telling me they're not hearing the question, like, you know, down the line, like it's it's organic every time. It is, it's pretty wild that they all end up uh, that that you know that that many of them would end up mentioning Jaden Blue, and now we're going to find out like who really gets, you know, who gets those big time carries, and is it really one guy getting those big time carries? Yeah, and look, I think the running back thing is interesting. Look, people will hear this show, and they'll say, "Catch just thinks he knows more than." a coach that just led his team to the, to the, to the playoffs thinks he knows more than to shard choice would be like catch to think that he knows more than these guys and have all of this experience. It's like, well, no, like we're just having a conversation today about the scrimmage. We'll get into some other components of it. What's interesting about the Jaden blue thing was that the defense kind of, had its way with the offense on Saturday. It wasn't like in the scrimmage, Blue broke off a bunch of big runs, and that was the precipice for people calling out his name. In fact, defense got the better of the offense. The two biggest plays of the day um, in team scrimmage was a pass, if I'm not mistaken, from, and I may get the combos on this wrong, but Ewers, I think, connected with Helm, and Manning connected with Nyblack. There were two passes to the tight ends that were big plays. But other than that, the defense kind of did its thing. And yet, Jaden Blue was a guy that, like, dudes just kept mentioning. Again, defensive guys were mentioning Jaden Blue. As a random note, nobody said Arch Manning's name out loud out of 20 interviews, which kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You thought maybe they would. I thought one guy would say, I just wanted to see what Arch Manning looked like in the flesh. Maybe Mm -hmm. ask for his autograph. Like, you know, (laughs) 
but not, that didn't happen. So it was just kind of interesting to me. The thing is, if Jonathan Brooks weren't hurt, if he didn't tear his ACL, it feels like Jonathan Brooks would be, have been the first running back taken in this upcoming NFL draft. It still sounds like he'll go on day two, where it's that, you know, there's a lot of talk the Cowboys could take him in round two. Like, imagine if he was healthy. He didn't start last year when the season started, both against Rice and against Alabama. CJ Baxter got the start. CJ Baxter had six out of 13 games that he played in last year where he averaged less than four yards per carry. And yet there was never a loss in faith and trust in Baxter. The coaches love them some CJ Baxter. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jaden blue might not even be in Austin right now. Had Jonathan Brooks not got hurt because take out the rice game. Before Brooks's injury, Blue didn't have a game the entire season where he had more than five carries. So it wasn't until Jonathan Brooks got hurt that Blue hits the field. And our eyeballs, it's consensus. Texas fans and people notice like, holy hell, like this guy's pretty freaking exciting. He's good. Mm Mm-hmm. In fact, so good that he got big NIL offers once the season ended that I think kept him from hitting the portal. The foot, the, the coaches are telling him, hey, you're going to be a big part of the offense. And on the NIL side, he got paid. If he hadn't done what I just described, they'd have been like, ah, show us. And then, then you'll get your big NIL deal. No, th- he got paid. Because they knew they had to do whatever they needed to do to keep him. But to see, there's another world out there where we never really see much of Jonathan, uh, uh, Jaden Blue last year. He transfers, and Baxter is the main guy. And then all of these other guys, three through six, are battling to be the backup. It's almost as if this Jaden Blue sensation happened on accident. And yet, if you ask me, who I think starts the opener and probably starts against Michigan next year. It's probably going to be CJ Baxter, even though blue average 1.4 more yards per carry and three more yards per reception than Baxter did a year ago. And people can't stop talking about Jaden blue. The, all of these dynamics make it an interesting conversation. It's not, they've got two good running backs Who's the best between the two? It's all of these things. It's Baxter starting last year, the opener. He The only thing that allowed Jonathan Brooks to emerge as the starter was an injury to Baxter. That before the injury, they were kind of getting equal reps. Uh, and then Brooks is the only guy, if you'll remember, against Wyoming because Baxter was hurt. And then Brooks was probably the best player on the field that night. He had like 160 something. And then the job just became his. But I don't know. Like I'm I'm fascinated to see how this unfolds. And I, I have to admit, hearing so many five-star level prospects single out Jaden Blue caught my attention. Up over 300 folks in the Specs chat already. We have some interesting chats we will get to real quick. Let's take a breath and remind you that Specs is ready for you. Might need to get stocked up for that men's championship game tonight. Here you go. You're needing Specs same day delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world class wines to hard to find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's Specs. Cheers to savings. 8.20 Central Time tonight. God help us on that tip-off. Might need to mix in some coffee if you want to get to the end of UConn and Purdue and your old men like me and Catch. Uh, I don't know why I'm making the, the whole game. I don't know if I am either. And I would say to Tracy in the chat, maybe we don't do this. Is Baxter trending toward being a bust? Whoa, whoa, dude, whoa. I don't think that's the discussion here. No, and having. look, it's important. Baxter played last season hurt a lot. Like, I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. Did we ever fully see a healthy CJ Baxter? And I think you do have to mention that towards the end of the season, I thought he started to show improvements that I think the issue for me with Baxter was that one game he'd averaged six yards per carry the next game he'd averaged two and a half. And that there was a lot of box of chocolate games for, Mm -hmm. uh, for CJ Baxter. And look, and if we're going to be fair, I've said this about Ruben Owens at A&M, the same is true for CJ Baxter. You got to average, like both of those guys are in the fours. I can't remember exactly what Ruben's Owens was, but CJ Baxter averaged 4.8 yards per carry. Like that'll do in the NFL for sure. But in college football, the best players generally in that six yards per carry. And Jonathan Brooks, 6.077, if I'm not mistaken. Jaden Blue, 6.123. So, mm-hmm. Blue, by the slightest of margins, ends up having the highest yards per carry a year ago. Baxter is not a – no, Baxter is going to be an NFL player. But is he a top-of-the-draft player or is he, like, a guy? Because Baxter is going to play this year. He's going to play next year. He might start three seasons. He'll go off to the NFL. But is he an elite guy or is he just a pretty good player? So far – I think he's just been pretty good. And look, Jaden Blue hasn't played enough to be like, oh, Jaden Blue's exceptional. He had like 65 carries on the season. So not enough of a workload to make definitive statements. But we're having a conversation. Don't overreact. Yeah, I would agree. By the way, catch 3.8 for Ruben Owens, a full yard under that average. God, was it 3.8? 3.8. So on behalf of CJ Baxter, how dare you? How dare no you? No shit. Make that comparison. I didn't realize it was that low. I thought you were right. I thought it was a little, a little over four. Cotton says Baxter is the guy blue will thrive in his role, which he has done. That I think is, that's the perception of a lot of, of maybe fans. And the question catch is, is that the perception of the coaches Last year, this is the number I keep thinking of, is 200. Because when you look at Sarkeesian, and I would tell people, go look, uh, go dig into Anwar's uh, Sunday pulpit this week, where he goes into, and he's taking a look at that uh, Bama 2020 discussion that we've been having about, can you get that production? But go look at running back numbers. When Sark has a badass running back crew, generally one guy gets 200 or more carries. The year in 2020, Najee Harris was at 251. Previous year, he was at 201. So last year, catch, these guys are at 138 for Baxter, 65 for Blue. But we've got to factor in the Jonathan Brooks math. Brooks was at 187. Can you and I reasonably assume he was going to find 200 if he didn't get hurt? Exactly. Of course. Of course he was. Now, 13, right? 13 carries. They would have found him. 13 carries. So the question becomes he would have been closer to 250 than two. Yeah. He, w- he would have been closer to Najee Harris in 2020, that 251 number. So I think both of these guys, I don't think there's a certainty of either one of them to say you're going from 138 to 200. That's a big jump. And for blue, it's 65 to 200. It's almost that not quite the John Tate cook discussion we've had, but it's kind of like that. Instead of eight catches to lead the team, you're talking 65 carries to lead the team in carries and be the guy, be the dog. Maybe that's that's what we're trying to figure out with the running backs. Well, Brooks gets hurt in the final four games of the season. The workloads between Blue and Baxter were pretty even. Baxter with a slight edge. I looked at the numbers yesterday. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But in the bowl game, C.J. Baxter had 103 total yards of offense. Blue had 104. Like, you know, at the end, they were getting similar touches. The workloads were were similar. I just, I wonder, what would Blue have to do to be the leader? To be the guy that finishes with, with, with the higher numbers this year? We have the answer for Jonathan Brooks. The answer ultimately was best running back in college football. Because 
it's very possible that Baxter would have just kept being the starter and Jonathan, Jonathan Brooks might have still been on campus for this year, right? If there's this alternative universe where Baxter doesn't get really hurt in the Alabama game, which causes him to miss the Wyoming game, which opens the door for Brooks to basically take the job. And then also it's the sliding doors, Deontay Foreman, Chris Warren deal. Because if you'll remember that year, Warren started, but got hurt in the opening game. Mm. And then Deontay Foreman by default. Yeah. Ends up getting like 50 carries a game. (laughs) And he goes Doak Walker on everybody. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen if Chris Warren doesn't get hurt. Jonathan Brooks, his entire outlook probably changes if Baxter never gets dinged up against Alabama. He only missed one full game and then was back by the Baylor game. And by then, though, Brooks Brooks did like 165 against uh, Wyoming at like seven and a half yards per carry. And then he went 100 yards against Baylor, 100 yards against Oklahoma. And Baxter was not quite – not quite. He wasn't matching those those type of contributions. And suddenly it was just Jonathan Brooks's offense. But there is an alternative universe where those things don't happen. They split the reps more evenly than they ended up doing. Jaden Blue transfers, and it's a still a one-two punch of Baxter and Brooks. But we might be asking the same question, which is what would have to happen mm-hmm. for Brooks or, you know, for Baxter to be 1B instead of 1A. And I'm curious to see what it looks like. If the coaches are seeing the same thing and they're like, look, man, we got to get the ball more to Jaden Blue, period. Like, we love us and CJ, but Jaden Blue's better. Like, what has to happen for that to become the thought? We'll see. Final two weeks of spring practice, I'm waiting to hear that CJ Baxter has – a Colin Simmons day like Colin Simmons had on Saturday because I think Simmons has had a pretty quiet camp. And then on Saturday he had a couple of sacks, a strip fumble guys are mentioning him at practice. Like, Hey, it was good to see Colin Simmons in practice. You know what? Five stars like seeing other five stars looking badass in practice. Yeah. Guys that well, cause it's guys they know, right. It's their, it's a guy they consider sort of their equal in terms of their that peer. rating. Yeah. It's a peer. And they're like, Oh, they like to see my peer is kicking ass. Cause that's what I plan to be doing. They don't want to hear. I don't know. I didn't even notice him out there. So, yeah. and, uh, and even think about more on a more personal level, a guy like DeCorey and more, he's not just seeing a peer. He's seeing a teammate. He's seeing a guy that wore the uniform he wore in high school do that. Like, that's just got to be extra amounts of pride, but also the information of, yeah, they're going to, you know, they're going to get us studs in if you come to Texas. We'll talk more about this in the recruiting hour later today, but DeCorea Moore knows who Ryan Wingo is. I'll tell you that. Mm, Interesting. And Uh, And he made a point to single him out and say, that dude is athletic and fast and Damn. That's good. That's that is good news. Good news all the way around. Uh, we will get into the recruiting hour today at four o'clock. Some good uh, chats coming in on the specs chat. I'm just going to give Nathan first up here because he made a great nerdy reference. I think we're going to see what a fully operational Baxter is capable of. Alderon is scheduled for August 31st. That's well done, Nathan. Well done. Well done. And I don't disagree with Nathan. Super nerdy. Really enjoy that. But. Yeah. Is Baxter better than Blue? Look, because I don't, I don't, right? I don't know. I, I, it's, it's a rhetorical question at this point. I'll only say this: everybody seems to be mentioning Blue. Baxter doesn't quite get the same level of mention. I don't know what that means. Maybe it means nothing, or maybe it does mean something. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, Chad, let's talk about the defense a little bit. The Empire struck back on Saturday. Mm. Matter of fact, I think it was Racing Guillory who owes us an interview. If you're out there, Mr. Guillory, don't think we've forgotten. (laughs) Um, He was a great interview, by the way. I don't know how he'll be on camera, but that dude loves to talk. 
He's pure running back, pure nice. skill position at 16 years old, or maybe even 15. Um, he was telling me that, or he was telling the interviewer, oh, I heard coming into today's scrimmage that the offense had been kind of having its way with the defense more times than not. But on Saturday, the defense did its thing. Every recruit was pretty unanimous in that one person made a point to say they love the smack talk between both sides. And he was like, but the defense is the one that backed it up. So it was a day where the front line for the defense controlled the line of scrimmage. Anthony Hill was a playmaker. He forced the C.J. Baxter fumble that got C.J. Baxter in trouble with the chart choice. And the secondary wasn't giving the receivers anything. I didn't hear one guy mention Isaiah Bond. I didn't hear one guy actually mention Ryan Wingo beyond um, what DeCorian Moore said. Nobody mentioned John Tay Cook other than in a very generic, John Tay Cook looks in general like a badass, but none of those guys did things in the scrimmage. So it's a z- these things are zero-sum games, right? Like offense gets... Offense looks bad. Defense looks good. But on Saturday, didn't hear that the offense ran the ball real well. Well, maybe that means that interior defensive line that we've been asking questions about throughout spring, maybe it played better. Baron Sorrell got shout outs. Ethan Burke got shout outs. Anthony Hill got shout outs. And the entire secondary seemed to perform at a really high level which is notable because last year it ranked in the hundreds. So at a boy defense, um, I, I it, they clearly won the day. It just wasn't one of those days where the SID department was putting together a highlight reel, a sizzle reel where it was like, look at all these badass passes from Quinn Ewers to the receivers. The defense did its thing. And I think, that's probably good for the program as a whole that the battle between those two sides is more even than just one continues to get the better side, the better of the other. No, I think that is important. Uh, Specs chat is rolling. If you want to throw us a super chat, we'll get that right to the front. We'll get back to some chats real quick. I'll tell you something I'm excited about. Hayes city store. I'm always looking forward to it, but now I've actually got a spot because this weekend we're going to fit it in. We're going to fit it in. The girls are excited to go. I'm looking at that that uh, chicken fried por- uh, chicken fried pork chop and we're going. Hey City Store out there in Driftwood. FM 150. I'm just getting my order in mind this week. The incredible food, the amazing drink, the awesome atmosphere. It's just the perfect place to be here in the springtime, out under those beautiful shade trees or you could sit inside in the ice house. They've got all kinds of great, a couple different options for you there and just the best food and drink you've ever had. I am so excited that I'm headed to Hayes City Store this weekend. You get over there too. There's your QR code. Tell Travis and Tamara that we said hello when you hit Hayes City Store. Um, In terms of the chat, there are a few things coming in. Um, let's see. Somebody wants to know catch on a technical side. Did Chad get a new camera? I feel like he's in 4k. I did not get a new camera. I did open the window and blind since it's eclipse day. Cause I wanted to see if there's any difference as we're doing the show. So that might be a little bit of a different, uh, you, difference look there. Like, you don't look like a mini Chad. Uh, our man, Alan, thank you for that. Our man, Alan, says to smash the like button. And JD says, I think Chad finally figured out yes! how to shrink himself. JD, I appreciate you noticing. I did not know if anybody would. You're the first person to say something. I have been working on it, so I appreciate it. Uh, thank you Are for that. Are you working on a beard? Uh, working on is, I am not shaving due to laziness, but I'm not working on a beard. Yeah. Those are two separate things. Two separate deals. Thought about shaving today. Then it just didn't happen. That's what I shaved this morning because I felt very homelessly. Well, you're looking good. And I've realized while doing our chat today, our meeting, a weekly meeting, I realize I probably need to shave. Hopefully by tomorrow, I will get that done. I am starting to look a little bit, a little bit on the- It's funny, it only takes like five minutes. It's not like, oh, I got to dedicate an hour 
to shave. It's not I that know. big of a deal, but it can be the kind of thing where you're like, eh, I'll do that maybe tomorrow. Yep, especially considering the last time I did it, I got distracted and I actually cut myself. So, you know, you get a little skittish for the next one. So we'll get it done. We will get it done at some point. And for this chatter, uh, Darwin says, Chad, does A&M have a team anymore? They are going to field a football team this year at A&M. And in 145 days, they'll play Notre Dame. So, uh, and of course, they're on Texas's schedule. So we will definitely keep an eye on the other side of the house divided as uh, as things go on. And the spring game is at the exact same time as Texas. So I'll be checking out the spring game for A&M and reporting back to you uh, that next week. Do not worry. Uh, in terms of the running backs for Texas, we've gone from the favorite player being the backup quarterback to who's the backup running back. Good problems, according to Cotton. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I would say good problems, but I just think catch. There's a other than Quinn at the other two skill spots. There's just there's questions out there. Of do you have your absolute? You can hand in the ball 200 times running back. I don't know. Do you have your throw him the ball 80 times receiver? I don't know. We, we really don't. We're going to have to see this all play out. The talent's there, but do you have your absolute horses? Not quite sure. Well, it's like which horse is better than the other or faster than the other or however we want to phrase it. Mm -hmm. And then you think you think one thing potentially and the coaches might think another. And then you're left in a weird place when – a fan base or a group of people think one thing that flies in contrast with maybe the thing that the coaches are doing. Someone asked me, you know, I think I said earlier today on the Monday of a reaction show that, you know, blew a much higher yards per carry and three more yards per reception than Baxter. And someone said, well, what about his blockers? And I thought, well, I tried to remember that thought that Sark made a year ago. Remember when he said he he had like four or five guys that he felt like all were kind of not the same as blockers, but they had like the stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. Baxter was in that group. I can't remember if Blue was. Like that was August. I don't remember. Because it was kind of a throwaway comment that we remembered, but now the season's long gone and I don't remember. But I probably would give Baxter the edge. He's bigger than Blue. So I'd probably say he's ahead of him as a blocker. Um, and that matters too. Like there's a lot of components in this. Um, don't think that we hate CJ Baxter. We don't. I rated CJ Baxter higher as a recruit. And people were pointing out as recent as Saturday that once upon a time, I actually questioned Jaden Blue's explosiveness as a prospect. So, you know, I say this all the time. Chad and I ask questions. Chad asked a question in a team meeting that we had for Orange Bloods earlier today. I didn't have a full answer, but Chad asked questions. That's what we do. That's why he and I get along so much. I ask questions. He asks questions. And sometimes we just start trouble. He didn't yeah. start any trouble today, but sometimes we do. Uh, Chad, let me ask it to you like this. Any questions about the scrimmage? Um, I mean, you mentioned the you mentioned the defense standing out over the offense outside of Collins. You mentioned Colin Simmons. Heard you say Baron Sorrell's name, and I saw that in in your reporting. It was it was cool to see eighty eight pop up. You mentioned Ethan Burke. Any other names on defense that need to be? I think you may have mentioned Anthony Hill as well. Yeah. Um, outside of those big names, anything else really jumping out to you? Um, maybe at the linebacker or defensive back level? Are you hearing some things you that you want to hear right now? You hearing anything that that concerns you? Anything that excites you from the middle and back end? Let's start with the positive. Okay. In the secondary. Uh Malik Muhammad's been battling some niggling little injuries, but seems like he was back on Saturday and He's doing when he's on. Um, I think he's been fasting for the last month. You know, like there's yeah. some there's some complexities to his situation uh, that you know. I think he's doing what he's doing, but it's you know 
I, I don't know what it means to fast. And he's been dealing with a little bit of, I think maybe a hammy a little bit, but not so much of a, a thing that he wasn't out there on Saturday. Him and I heard good things about Terrence Brooks on Saturday. Um, heard good things about Kobe Black. So the corners heard good things about Derek Williams, Andrew McCuba. There was a lot of a variety of names mentioned in the secondary. I don't know how many days officially Texas has practiced so far. I've lost count. At one point I said six when it was actually seven. So I think maybe they I think they may be through nine with two weeks to go, three, and not even fully. They got maybe six to go in the next 12 days. The last day being obviously the spring game. I'm going to tell you the most depressing thing that you're going to hear all day if you're a Texas football fan. Okay. Other than Anthony Hill and a little bit of David Benda, just a baby bit, baby bit. I haven't had a single freaking linebacker. Oh, and Darren Gallette got mentioned one time. I haven't had any other linebackers mentioned in nine days of practice. Not Black, uh, not Blackshire, the transfer from Alabama. Not, not any of those guys from last year's recruiting class that they brought in five. Um, they're up. They're they're in a bad way if anything would happen to Anthony Hill because hmm. Anthony Hill gets mentioned every day. He. Got mentioned on Saturday. It's It feels, from a buzz standpoint, pretty barren at linebacker right now. And I'm not saying that those guys won't step up. It's like five months to go until the season gets here. They still got 20-plus practices before they'll do a depth chart. So from 30,000 feet up, it's still early. But... You asked the question, hey, anybody else? Uh, by the way, you can tell my voice. I may feel better, but my voice isn't quite bad. I feel like I'm going through puberty. Um, no, I'm not hearing other linebackers mentioned. And feels like a thing. I, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like that happens at any other position. I mentioned in my 10 thoughts on the weekend that other than Nye Black, Juan Davis, and Gunnar Helm, I'm not hearing anything, any other tight ends. I haven't heard a single other tight end's name mentioned. But that's three guys. Mm -hmm. If you're three deep at tight end, those are rich people problems. Right. Plus, I can't think of a name I'd really, if I'm a Texas fan, is there a name I absolutely want to hear that outside of those three that would depress me that I'm not hearing it? No, because Spencer Shannon's a redshirt freshman. Will Randall's a redshirt freshman. Jordan Washington's a true freshman. Yeah, right. There's what you don't want. You don't want to hear that one of those three guys is really disappointing. You don't want to hear that they feel like they don't have a tight end. But those not guys are either. nothing bad. It's just blank. Just there, right. Okay. Um, But... You know, if 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 Texas fans were sitting with AM fans and an AM fan said, Hey, what's bothering you about the football team right now? And if a Texas fan said, I just don't know what the hell we're gonna do for a fourth tight end. Okay. The Aggie fan response would be shut up. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, right. that'd be the response if an AM fan was like, you know. Really don't know who our fourth tight end is going to be. I mean, yeah. But if I say for either team, you know, they it feels like they've got one linebacker and everybody else is just a guy. I don't even know how to quantify what that means. But yeah, whatever that whatever that is, alarm bells is what that is. Yeah. So I think in the next two weeks. If you're a Texas football fan and you're like, what do I want to hear at some point in the next two weeks? I want to hear, give me just one, 
somebody not named Benda and Anthony Hill specifically starting to turn it up at tight end, or excuse me, linebacker. Uh, and then you can get it. I think I, you'd like to hear the wide receiver because this was my other, this was my hot take earlier today. And I think, um, James, your super chat real quick. If you're talking about this past weekend, uh, I didn't, we didn't do an interview with Keelan Russell. I don't remember seeing him on campus. Uh, I'll double check that, but it, I would expect him to be on campus in the next couple of weeks, maybe the spring game. I certainly didn't see a picture of him this weekend. I got sent pictures nonstop of guys that were seen. I don't remember. KJ Lacey was in town this weekend. So, you know, maybe maybe give KJ Lacey the five-star treatment, um, given that he made the trip from Alabama. Um, we started – the conversation this spring talking about the depth at the wide receiver position that man, they, they're going to have to play five, six guys this year. They got good players. And I don't disagree with that, but the wide receiver position as is, is a big step back from a year ago. Like, like I've said this before, but let's say it again. There's not a receiver on campus right now from like where they are at in their development that warrant being in the same conversation with Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell and probably Jordan Whittington. Like, don't do it. We we have to stop that. Those guys are getting ready to go into the NFL. Two of those guys are going to hear their names very early in the draft. The thing I hear about John, and look, Chad and I love John Tate Cook. We are founding members of the fan club. But I'm hearing he's got to be more consistent. They want more consistency. I haven't heard a damn thing about Isaiah Bond throughout camp. So we know he's talented. We know that he was best receiver on that Alabama team a year ago. Quiet spring workout so far. Um, in fact, you know, he's he's getting run as that third receiver. He's running with the ones, but where we really mentioned his name the most was when Ryan Wingo was with the ones one time. There's probably been more pure Ryan Wingo buzz than Isaiah Bond. DeAndre Moore's playing a lot, but it wasn't like he got open and made a bunch of plays in the scrimmage. Like this receiving core has a lot of talent. Chad and I think Jonte Cook going to get drafted really high one day. Probably the same with Isaiah Bond. Maybe the same with Ryan Wingo. But as of right now, they're an inconsistent bunch that just, they're not anywhere near as polished and as far along as Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell were a year ago. And I think we need to like marinate on that because Anwar wrote this weekend in his column, can Quinn Ewers be the 2020 Mac Jones that Sarkeesian worked with in that Alabama offense. Mac Jones went 41 touchdowns, four interceptions, mm -hmm. but he was throwing the ball to Devontae Smith, who won the Heisman. He was throwing the ball to Jalen Waddell. They had uh, John Mechie. You know, they had dudes that were just making plays everywhere. This group could be that they could get there, but they're not there yet. And I'm at the point when people say things like, Oh, it'll be a seamless transition. And this group might be better than the 2023 group. Slow down, slow down. Yeah, that's fair. Slow down. Because that's as good as Jonathan Brooks was last year, he, he wasn't better than B. John Robinson. He just wasn't. And, and CJ Baxter wasn't, Roshan Johnson. Now, the running game was really good, though, last year. So it's not like the two things can't be true at the same time. You know, could the running game last year have been really, really good? Yes. Like, they didn't really miss Bijan and Roshan a ton. But you wouldn't say, I never once saw Jonathan Brooks and thought, you know what? I think he's better than Bijan. Just never thought that. I thought he was maybe the best back in the country last year, but I didn't 
think that this receiving core, Chad, may turn out to be really good. But then if we were having a draft right now, <laughs> amongst all of these players, and we said the 2023 version of Xavier and Adonai were in the mix, it's not even close who the first two guys selected. are. It's like going to the park and Magic Johnson and Larry Bird are on the court. Hmm. And then – and then everybody else is just some dudes. Right now, that's who Xavier and Adam and I were. They're leaps and bounds ahead of where these guys are right now. So in these last six practices, you'd like to hear John Jay Cook really was a lot more consistent. Isaiah Bond starting to show up consistently. You want to start hearing the word consistent mentioned with these receivers because right now the lack of it is the thing that's probably being mentioned the most by most of our sourcing. Specs chat at 500 folks as we're looking at it right now. Thank you for jumping in today. Remember to like, subscribe, and get your notifications to Orange Bloods Live here. Let's get you a little reminder on sinus and snoring specialists. If you are sleeping like crap because you snore or you got sleep apnea or you got sinus issues or you got all the allergy stuff that's going on, this is a crazy time of year for allergies. Spring's coming, right? It's such a beautiful time, but it can be really unbeautiful if you have serious allergy problems. I had the allergy stuff too. In 2017, I went to sinus and snoring specialist and I got it taken care of. There is your QR code. They're right there at Parmer and Mopac and they are doing the very latest cutting edge stuff when it comes to ear, nose, and throat. Different paths for everybody. You've seen the commercials for Inspire. Ask them about that. Maybe it's a CPAP for you, like my wife deals with. She loves it and she's sleeping really well. Maybe it's more of my path or I didn't deal with either one of those, but it was about a procedure that Dr. Slaughter has at Sinus and Snoring Specialists that others don't have. Check into all of it. They'll treat you right, just like they did with me. Sinus and Snoring Specialists. Feel clear, rested, and healthy. 512-601-0303. The website is uh, sinussnoringent.com. All right, as we roll through this Monday, I'm just scanning the chat because I think I marked a couple here. Oh, this is an interesting question for you, Catch. Jason says, does Baxter Blue remind you of Selvin Young and Jamal Charles as a tandem? No. I had, I had, I'm not saying it's a bad comparison, but I don't think – I don't know who Baxter is in the Young Charles – it's certainly not Jamal Charles. So the question is, do I think Baxter and Selvin Young are kind of the same-ish? No. I mean, yeah. before Selvin Young got hurt, he was hell on wheel, like super, super explosive. There were people that thought Selvin Young was a better NFL prospect, prospect than Cedric Benson, but then Selvin Young had some injuries that – made him a little bit of a different player, but, and I, boy, I'm not going to disrespect Jamal Charles and say that Jaden blue warrants that either. So yeah, no, no. I think that's fair. Rhett throws in something on the receivers reminds me a little bit of the Packers with Jordan love going to take a bit for this group to acclimate with each other catch. That makes me think about the, the, the Quinn Ewers discussion and the note that I can't remember if it was you or Anwar had about, Maybe you've both heard it, but the fact of the comfortability level with Ewers and that Matthew Golden got mentioned as somebody he's getting comfortable with, we have to keep reminding ourselves that Quinn Ewers has got to find some comfort because four guys just walked out the door that he was comfortable with. Four. The most comfortable guy he would probably tell us is Baxter. Like, maybe Helm? I don't know, but he only threw well Helm. 14 balls. And it should be Cook because they've been playing together now. This is season number two. But the the consistency issues – look, and I love John Tay. I love – I'm a founding member of the fan club. Right. But I to, got stock. Yeah, but if we're going to express how many touchdowns – excuse me, not touchdowns. If we're going to express how many passes – Quinn Ewers has thrown to John Tay Cook. Catch, I only need to use one finger on the other hand. It's that many. It's eight, isn't it? No, Murphy threw him one of those and oh, Arch yeah. threw him the other. Oh. Quinn has thrown him that many. 
six. Damn. It's six. So people could have John wicked your fingers off. <laughs> Four of them, and you still would have had enough. Exactly. So just, you know, he, he's got to find that comfort level, and that's part of the fascination of this year. And what Steve Sarkeesian's really got to do is he's scheming it up. You know, he's got he, – we know he can scheme up talent. We know he can – we know he can drop some interesting plays. But catch the one thing that makes my question about 2020 Alabama stupid and insane is what Texas doesn't have coming back. Because Najee Harris was coming back and Devontae Smith was coming back. Texas does not have a running back or a receiver that Sark knows going in he can trust at that level. He just doesn't. Devontae, I think, caught 117 that year. Like, he doesn't have, we don't, we, we have no, and, and we got people like you and me in that fan club loving on John Tay Cook going, I think he can get to 70, maybe 75. There's a projection that, you know, Cody Carpentier threw out on Orange Bloods like 79. I think it's possible, but that's eight to 79. That's a hell of a jump. Well, and the good news is look, like this isn't us screaming fire in a crowded theater because this is a group that still has like five months to figure it out. They got six more practices in the spring. They've got all of summer offs. And I've always contended that the summer workouts are more important than what happens in the spring that I've just seen. I've been doing this a long time. I'm into my third decade of covering Texas football and a lot of stuff happens in the summer. And then you get another 15 practices in August. So like they got time. Time's actually on their side. However, we can say, you know, this team might go 11 and one next year while also pointing out they got to get more consistency from the wide receivers. We have to be able, and we are having multiple conversations at the same time where a lot of things that on the surface may sound like they're conflicting with each other actually are in unison together, and it's, you know, it's just kind of the reality of the situation that more is still needed, and I don't mean DeAndre Moore, um, and I think they're going to get there, but they're not there yet, and with two weeks to go in the spring, if we're going to have a real conversation about the state of things as they are, we can't ignore the elephants in the room. We have to be able to say, Receivers need to be more consistent. Not sure who the starting running back is, and I'm not quite sure they're starting the right guy. Um, don't know who the linebackers are beyond Hill and Benda. Nobody's being mentioned. And then also be able to say, but the secondary looks good. There's a lot of depth at running back. The quarterbacks are playing well. It seems like they're three deep at tight end. It feels like they got depth on the offensive line. I'll, I'll, I'll probably mention this again on the recruiting hour. One of the more interesting things that I heard in the interview sections of the recruits that were on hand, we did an interview with Lamont Rogers mm -hmm. and we asked Lamont Rogers the question of, Hey man, what stood out to you? Like I said, we asked, everybody got that question. And Lamont Rogers was like, yeah, no, Kelvin Banks is good. And um, the young guy, Trevor Gooseby, that guy's good. And I remember, huh, that's interesting because that guy plays maybe the position that Lamont Rogers wants to play. And, you know, if you want to sell playing time, <laughs> Lamont Rogers may be thinking and and only and maybe in like quiet conversations in the in deep, deep into his heart, but it seemed like he saw something from uh from Trevor Gooseby on Saturday that made him think taking that dude's position will be difficult. So um, that's a, but that's a positive, like, right. Again, wealthy people problems. What's your biggest problem right now? Well, we're having a hard time convincing the five-star offensive line prospect that we want that our second team left tackle is too good for him to jump in front of like, you no, know, cause it used to be the pitch used to be just look at our guys, look at our line. Do we need you? Look at them. Now the pitch is, hey, um, maybe 
Look over here. It's the Gilbert Godfrey routine, right? And right. What if I put something in this hand that would make you forget that Trevor Goosby is over here on this hand. $200? Ouch. Ah, you're burning my hand. Here's one. Here's two. Have a Merry Christmas. So it stood out to me that that Lamont Rogers didn't say Jaden Blue. He said the backup left tackle, who is a guy that if he showed up and signed with Texas, he'd be competing for, for reps on day one. So I thought that was interesting. This just in, kids, underrated sequel, Beverly Hills Cop 2. Be very afraid of Beverly Hills Cop 4, but those are two separate discussions. Well, three is – is three even watchable? Two is great. Two, two is a really good sequel. It doesn't get talked about enough. Three, to me, is horrific. I mean, it's horrific. It's really hard to get through. Eddie had to be forced to do it. The musical take on the Axel F theme is criminal movie behavior, and it's just hard to get through. It's hard to get through. The thing about two, I was listening, I was thinking about Lethal Weapon 2 this weekend, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about Joe Pesci, how great Pesci is in two. Yeah. Is Gilbert Gottfried in Beverly Hills Cop 2? Was he the – he's only in that one scene. Right. It's not that level. It's not that level to where it's that memorable, but it is a nice little – it's a nice little cameo that gives you like – it's like, oh, yeah. That movie yeah. happened 35 years ago, and I just dropped the reference. So. Yeah. You, yeah, and to be fair, I don't know if really anyone loves that scene as, mu as Sidney Bernstein as much as you and I do. I have no evidence that anyone else even knows that reference So, because we always make it to each other. But I would hope that it's that. But I don't think it quite goes to the – what is it, Louis Getz? Yes. The, Louis, I don't think it quite gets to the level of Pesci in Lethal Weapon. I'm just saying, does that character inspire what eventually becomes – because it's, it's a cop movie – with a supporting character piece whose only role is to come in cooking for like three minutes. Yeah. And just but to be there's good. more for Pesci to do yeah. than there is for Sidney Bernstein. Although, if they bring Bernstein back in Beverly Hills Cop 3, it's immediately a better movie. Oh, yeah, of course. They could have put you in Beverly Hills Cop 3 and it's a better movie like that. I mean, it's just... It's just it's not great. It is not not great at all. Uh, before we get to buy or sell and uh, and close it up, I'll tell you what is great. AV consultations. Whether you're watching Beverly Hills Cop 1 through 3 or you're watching your favorite other movies or the championship games, WrestleMania, all that stuff that looks better on big old HD screens. I know I'm the only one watching the UFL, but it looks better on big screens too. AV consultations has been setting it up since 1988. So if you're in the Austin area and you go to Pluckers, Cover 3, places like that, they set up the TVs in those places. So go in, check it out, start thinking of all those cool ideas that you may want to do. They can throw all kinds of cool screens in your house, make the screen bigger, better speakers, the, the furniture, all that stuff you'd want for your perfect man cave. You're 145 days today from Texas starting their season. So if you're a Longhorn fan, what you love your college football 145 days from now is college football starting and that means you got a little more time for the nfl make that your goal that you're going to finally get that man cave you've always talked about this season 255-8678 255-8678avconsultations.com can get it done as well give tom and the crew a call they will treat you right all right, Catch, before we hit buy or sell, anything else we need to hit for sure? No, because I think all the things I want to hit are in buy or sell. All right, let's do that, and then we'll see if there's anything left. You want to go first or second? I'll tell you what, I'll go first today. Okay. Buy or sell number one. The Texas softball team taking two of three from number one OU was your biggest surprise of the weekend. Uh, definitely a buy. Grabbing the game was 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 pretty cool. I was happy for them on that. Thought it was the right call into end game two. But uh, yeah, I was surprised to, to to take two or three. I can't think of anything that would have surprised me more. I could I could come up with like you know different 
things on the nerdy wrestling side, but no, nothing at WrestleMania that would have been that level of surprise. That was the story of the weekend. Good for Mike White and his crew, getting them in Austin, proving that that matters, and maybe catch it can give them some confidence because we know where the ultimate games will happen. The ultimate games they'll have to to handle that group in occur in the state of Oklahoma, and I think it's all in Oklahoma City, isn't it? The Big 12 tournament and yeah. – and the College World Series, it's all in Oklahoma City. So it's got to give them some confidence. So well done, ladies. Saw this on Orange Bloods over the weekend, and it it it, it hit hard. Buy or sell number two, the comparison of David Pierce to former Texas softball coach Connie Clark is so spot on that it actually hurts a little. Damn. Yeah, my, my face kind of got uglier. You did what I did! You were reading it. That's just... Yeah, I guess it's a buy. I have not dug through resume on resume, but yeah, I guess. I I'll buy it. That's that's painful. I feel like I needed to... I need another cleansing sip here. Ugh, yeah. Well, the thing is, Connie Clark was a good coach. Yes. But she's like a metaphor for, for like not quite being good enough. Mm -hmm. and right now especially after losing two or three to BYU over the weekend like I yeah. said and, and, well and also and with all due respect to whatever Texas softball is historically it's not like a drop in the swimming pool of greatness that Texas baseball is yeah it's not even close so that's the other thing is Pierce is living with the oppressive weight of his job. Connie Clark did not experience the kind of weight that he is experiencing right now. Because Texas baseball, it's just, it's a whole different thing. Maybe the most undertold story in Texas athletics history is that Texas went from Gus to Augie. And like the the, the thing should have been like, who replaces Gus? Gustafson, like who can do it? Then they brought in a guy that might be the best college baseball coach of all time. Right. So there's like a 50 year window where it's just those two guys. And now you're having, so the expectations are, well, you have to go to Omaha every year. Like, duh. It's well, cause isn't it true that Pierce is number five? Isn't it true that like forever it's like, like what dish Falk, Gus, Augie, yeah. I mean, they're like the Steelers in that they really are right. It's a very Pittsburgh Steeler kind of thing. So they only had this many coaches, right? Well, were they any good? Yeah, they really were. They and just the, never stopped winning. And the uh, pressure uh, on that next guy is silly. All right. Buy or sell number three. Caitlin Clark in South Carolina was basically a David versus Goliath matchup yesterday. Hmm. Um, I will sell that level of that level of comparison because Iowa missed some stuff down low. There were bunnies they missed. It was it got oppressive on the rebounding, I know. And and you know, Cardoso got got those 17 boards. They beat them how I thought they would beat them. They got to the paint too much. But there were moments where I thought Iowa could have gotten a little bit more and could have, you know, fed it to the center a little bit. So I won't quite go David versus Goliath, but I knew it'd be tough. I just knew it was going to be a, a climb, and they just they couldn't get there. But it was entertaining to watch. All I know is that South Carolina had a whole lot more big players that seemed to grab every rebound, and they just had more good players. Like, and here's the other. At yeah. one point, it was 36 to nothing for bench contribution, and I saw that stat flash up on the screen, and I was like, is that bad if you're Iowa? 36 have you, to nothing? Catch, have you ever seen that in your life? I think it ended 37 to nothing. Like, have you ever seen anybody get that outworked on the bench? Yeah, probably, but it doesn't stick out. Like, I, don't, I, don't I saw ever. that yesterday, and it just doesn't get more one-sided than – you need no hands and fingers – for the points and contribution from the Iowa bench yesterday. Okay. Yeah. This one, I just throw it in there. I could go in a couple of different directions, but. Okay. Buyer set number four. You're not surprised at all that only one person has commented on my Beyonce top 10 songs list on orangebloods.com so far. <laughs> uh, I will sell 
I'll sell that. I'm not going to. Yeah, I, I I would assume there would have been more more than that. Beyonce is one of those discussions that I feel like people take their Beyonce pretty seriously. So I'm surprised actually. So I'll, I'll sell. Texas girl, she's dominating the country charts. I thought it was very okay. timely. If I'd been on Miley Cyrus list, people would have gone ape shit. I did Beyonce and nobody commented. I'm just I'm is, judging a little yeah, bit. It's interesting. My my uh, my daughter's really excited about uh, the the Cowboy Carter. She's gotten into Beyonce over the last few months, and she says the new album's great. So I, I have not haven't heard it yet. I'm gonna give you a hot take. Okay. I listened to Cowboy Carter like three or four times this weekend. Mm -hmm. I kind of think it's a masterpiece. Oh, okay. It is like a combination of different things all happening. There are times I think I'm getting Beach Boys pet sounds. Then there are times I think I'm getting like Whitney Houston and like a, 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 a combination of that with like new edition, like, there's a there's a, these mix of songs that 27 tracks and they go kind of all over the place but it's it's pretty I, I don't vibe with every song mm -hmm. but man it's for all of the reaction from I'm not gonna like call out demographics but there's been like a reaction to the beyonce album reaction as it relates to like being country, mm -hmm. it's phenomenal. Like right. it is hands down a phenomenal album. Okay. All I'll right. Check it out at some point. And I'm going to deviate this a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm raising the stakes. Okay. My original fifth question in buy or sell was WrestleMania was 40, right? It was 40. Yes. WrestleMania 40 received an A grade from you last night. I'm going to ask the question differently. Right. Buy or sell. We watched one of the best WrestleManias of all time last night. Um, yeah, I'll buy. I mean, it's not like a Mount, I wouldn't say Mount Rushmore great, not like one of four, but yeah. if you're going to say like one of 10, like there's 40, if you're saying top 10, yeah, buy. Everybody loves to do the immediate thing and really overreact. Uh, but I thought it was good. Yeah, I, I could definitely go with an A type of grade. The feel good stuff with Cody, making you think of Dusty, grandson of a plumber, the mom. Um, you know, I don't know that. I don't know that Roman quite sold it the way I wanted him to at the end. But he got out of the way. You know, he got out of the way. He let Cody have his moment. And uh, and then overall, the night I thought was pretty good. The two nights, 145,000 people. I was entertained, absolutely. I was absolutely entertained. I really enjoyed it. Like, I was entertained. Um, Low-key, maybe my favorite moment of the night was when, who won the first match, the heavyweight championship? Um, Drew McIntyre. <laughs> they did, like. They did. They did a great job of hamming it up. He spent five minutes hugging people. He gave the belt to a woman that I presume is like supposed to be his girlfriend or I don't know. Like they did all of that. And then I don't even know the name of the dude that did it, but he cashes in his money in the bank. <laughs> and then he takes the belt from him in five minutes. He had it for five minutes and 40 something seconds, I think is the timing that they did. That was a brilliant little turn. And credit to um, credit to Drew McIntyre for the work he's been doing and for the work he's about to do because his reaction to that tonight is going to be <laughs> an all timer, an all timer, and it's going to help to put Damian Priest over as well. It's going to be so good. I just was watching it and I was like, okay. I was thinking a lot of things during that match. Like, why is this the first match? Is it just they want to really get it hype and get it going? I didn't know really the guys involved a ton. Like, you know, I'm a once a year, twice a year kind of a guy. Right. So I didn't really know a whole lot about him. But when I watched him hand a belt to the – I was like, I don't know who that woman is. Like, And they weren't – I think even the announcers were like, we believe this is like his love interest. <laughs> and then for the way that it happened, you know, just the whole thing was – chef's kiss perfect um and i was thinking god i don't remember seeing that 
that specifically, I don't recall ever. Qu- I've seen versions of that happen, mm-hmm. but at WrestleMania for a guy to get the belt like that. And then <laughs> even Kerry Von Erich's heavyweight championship reign thought that that was a little <laughs> embarrassing. That was good. Yep. It was good stuff. Good okay. stuff. All right. That's your five, correct? Yes. All right. Here we go, Catch. Let's start here. Just to reiterate, buy or sell number one. For you, the biggest talking point on the Longhorns coming out of the weekend is running back, and who will get those number one carries? No, oh, it's a probable buy, but I would also say the wide receiver bit where those guys got to be more consistent. And that the defense played really, really, really well at the scrimmage and won the day um, our co-biggest talking points. All right. I will not put number two on the screen because I've undersold it now to hear how much you checked out WrestleMania. So I'm going to do it this way. Buy or sell number two. You did watch WrestleMania and you were so entertained. You're going to check out Raw after WrestleMania tonight. Bye. I am going to watch Raw tonight because... There's a lot that I want to see how it gets addressed. And and I'm assuming you've watched a Raw after WrestleMania before. It is always the Raw yes. to watch. Okay. And I thought there was going to be a little bit more. What I expected to happen was that The Rock would turn on Roman. Mm-hmm. And there's been a lot of predict- predictions that there was there's going to be like the a family feud there. It did WrestleMania didn't end with us in that place. So I'm I'm curious to see. Yeah, I want to see a number of storylines and kind of where they go. I'm in for tonight. Yeah. We'll More so than I am for the basketball game. There you go. Speaking of, buy or sell number three. No matter what happens tonight, the women's tournament will overshadow the men for you. Bye. It was a better, it's been like maybe there's a great championship game tonight. I was I kept my I was doing I was watching Liverpool play Manchester United yesterday. Don't ask me about it. I'm still pissed. Um, but I'm writing my column. I'm doing a lot of different things. But I'm right here is where the clock is on my screen, and I made sure I was constantly. Is it two o'clock yet? Is it two? Is it two? I really wanted to watch that game last yeah. night or yesterday afternoon. I think even with the non prime time setup, it will have better ratings uh, than the men. The women have more, more and better stars. There's no, I can name like five women's basketball players. And I don't think outside of the guys I've really covered in the big 12, if we go, the men's side just doesn't have the stars that the women have. And yeah. I'm curious because the women will have like 10 returning potential megastars next year. There's some really good players coming back to to women's basketball, but there's no Caitlin Clark. Can any of those other women capture any of the Caitlin Clark stuff? Because she's something else, man. I'd I'd watch her play tonight if there was a game. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm like, could anything get me to watch the WNBA? Maybe Caitlin Clark. Like I've, I've it's never a- really been in, but man, she's something else. She really is like the Steph Curry of women's basketball. And I dig that. Like I, I didn't realize how much I would dig it until I've experienced it. And I'm like, she's pulling up from half court. <laughs> yeah. Let's have more of that. So yeah, I, it, it has absolutely overshadowed the men. Yeah, I'm wondering if she and Angel Reese could have a bird magic effect on that league. Could they jack it up to where people are actually caring about that league as they go in? Will your daughter keep watching Caitlin Clark? Exactly, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. I've been asking my daughter and my wife, hey, draft's coming up in in a week. She'll get drafted probably by Indiana. Will you care about Indiana Fever basketball? Right now they're just saying, I don't know, I'm not sure, but we'll see. Uh, all right, catch buy or sell number four. Let's stay in hoops. John Calipari will be replaced at Kentucky by one of these four names: Billy Donovan, Nate Oates, Dan Hurley, Scott Drew. I'll go by Nate okay. Oates was the name that seems obvious, except he's got an eighteen million dollar buyout. 
Well done, Bama. Does Kentucky have the guts to just go for it? Hey, they did just save a lot of money because they didn't have to. Fi- they didn't fire him. That Arkansas has. Arkansas just did what A and M tried to do with Jimbo. Yep. It's like, who's the biggest badass? We can get. We're going. Calipari wants to listen. Fine. Let's go get John Calipari. It's my mind is still. It's in explosion mode. I cannot believe. I know that Arkansas has pulled that off. It goes to show you that in 2024. Coaches just aren't going to take shit from fan bases. Yeah. Cal by Party, the way, clearly did, Kentucky was kind of done with Calipari, yeah. but he was kind of done with them too. Kind of like the Florida State Jimbo thing. Yeah. People were pissed at Jimbo, right, in Tallahassee. Uh, real quick, Catch, did you see who said no to Arkansas before they got Calipari? Yes, but I've forgotten. It was Chris Beard. Oh, I didn't see that. Chris Beard said no to them. Chris Beard, and there's another name. There's two names that said no to them and went back to their other schools. Can't recall who the other one is right now, but Beard turned them down. Yeah, well, why? Beard's a year into Ole Miss. I, I, turning down Kentucky. Wow. No, 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 no. He oh, turned Arkansas. down Arkansas. Right, yeah. right, right. He turned down Arkansas. Um, Would Beard be in play for Kentucky? I don't know, right? I have no idea. This is going to be wild to see who ends up at Kentucky. Hey, no pressure. Uh, you're just going to be the Kentucky basketball coach. And finally, catch buy or sell number five. You have your Eclipse glasses ready for today, and you're going to check it out. Buy. My wife bought Eclipse glasses, so we have them. Mm-hmm. The thing is, it's dark outside right now. Like, we're getting rain. It's a little cloudy here. I'm still seeing some light. We're not officially to it yet, but we're minutes away. We're just minutes away here, Catch. I saw a tweet yesterday. As a matter of fact, I'm going to send this to you right now. Mm -hmm. It's a tweet I saw yesterday. I'm going to put it in Teams in the main section. Okay. It's 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 a plane full of people. It's like, the steward has asked a plane full of people on the way to Arkansas how many people on the flight were making the trip to Arkansas on that flight uh-huh. for the eclipse. Yeah. Look at it. Everybody everybody says yes. Look at the picture. Oh, hang on. I sent it to you. Okay. Hang on. Hold I on. probably should have had it ready to go and I could have pulled it up on the screen. That's no, all right. It's all right. Come on, phone. We can do it. Come on. Come, Come on. on. Load it. Come on. Lo- Come on. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm sorry I did this to you. That's all right. It's okay. It's everybody is what, I, what I'm ultimately. Oh, I got you. I see them now. Every single, look like every hand on that plane is up. <laughs> That's I crazy. Mean, I can't say I care enough to want to. No. God, no. I just Dude. look. Maybe I won't be able to see the eclipse because there's too much rain today where I live. But I'm not like no. I don't have plans. So I, hey. yeah, catch. I'm 49 <laughs> years old and I am the son of a scientist. This ain't my first eclipse. All right. Thanks to Doc Hastings, <laughs> I've watched an eclipse or two. I'll go check it out. I got my glasses ready, but I'm not going to flip out about it. By the way, real quick, happy birthday wishes going out to my parents. Doc and Sylvia are both celebrating a birthday today. They were born 13 hours apart. So happy birthday to them. My dad gets an eclipse as a birthday present this year. So uh, they, I'm sure they'll have a good time. So happy birthday to the folks today. Wrap us Anything up, Dad. All right, we're wrapping. Oh, we're headed out to Hastings. Yes, we're headed out to watch the eclipse. Like, subscribe, get your notifications, and get some of these, or don't look at the eclipse directly. That is dangerous. Thank you for supporting Orange Bloods Live. We'll be back at four with the recruiting hour. We'll talk about five stars that we're in for the weekend, the reactions that uh, Texas got, and uh, Ketch will get you updated on some big names that you'll care about if you're a Texas football fan. So come on back at four for that. Everybody have a good rest of your Monday. Enjoy the eclipse. We are house divided. Have a good one. Be safe.